good morning, everyone. And I would like to now invite our chairperson, uh, Dr. Rajesh, sir, over onto the dais. Uh, Dr. Somashila, she'll be joining us shortly. Uh, Dr. Mulithar, please. Uh, Dr. Rishi Swaroop. And Dr. Sunita, ma'am. Welcome everyone uh, to the session on acute high drops, case situations and video based session. And uh, I thank my co-moderator, Dr. Jaya, for being such a big support and helping us in formulating this session. I thank AIOC and uh, Professor Namrata Sharma for this also. So without further ado, I can just please go ahead. Yeah. all know that acute high drops was known to us um, since almost 1854 and the term was coined only in 1940 and we all know that it has been defined until recently as acute corneal high drops being an uncommon complication of corneal ectatic disorders. It involves sudden onset corneal edema as well as a rupture in the Desmase membrane and causes a lot of impaired vision and eye pain. So I'll come to that uh, rupture in the Desmase membrane in a bit. And we know that it starts early in the, uh, in the uh, 25 age group as well as it's common in uh, males. And the incidence of acute eye drops occurring in the fellow keratoconic eye is almost to the tune of 40%. It is seen more in cases of PMCD and keratoglobus. can also be seen in post-LASIK ectasia eyes, post-trauma, post-RK, DLK and PK eyes for keratoconus and even has been reported after cross-linking. The top uh, risk factors are allergic disease leading to eye rubbing, a younger age group and trisomy 21. So the eye rubbing might even precipitate uh, the episode which is marked by sudden onset loss of vision, photosensitivity and pain. And the slit lamp findings are very typical. It is, they ha it is marked stromal and um, microcystic edema of the epithelium. And there is as well as uh, large boule might also be seen and there might be presence of intrastromal cysts and clefts. And uh, sidles test might be positive, not because of the perforation but because of the transudation of fluid. And it's important to remember that the examination of the other eye is important for looking for the signs of ectasia and the predisposing conditions such as allergic eye disease. So most cases of acute high drops spontaneously resolve over a period of two to four months. But um, they might be, if, if the defects are larger, then they might take longer time along with uh, vision impairing scars as well as presence of corneal neovascularization. So coming over to the pathogenesis, with the current advances in our understanding of the disease, Dua et al. have now described it as acute high drops is due to a sudden split in the desmase as well as the pre-desmetic layer resulting in the ingress of aqueous within the stroma. So uh, if I may let Femi take you through the types of desmase detachment that are actually described. As we see in the picture on the top, there is a desmase detachment which is seen, which is almost like a straight line, like a chord of the circle. And that is type 1 detachment, which is basically uh, uh, this rip in the desmase as well as the pre-desmetic or the duas layer from the posterior stroma. In the second picture, there is an undulating membrane um, almost with a double contour. And this is type 2 detachment where only the desmase membrane has detached. And in the lo lower picture, there is an undulating membrane in the periphery and as well as a straight line. So this is a mixed type of a detachment wherein both layers have detached and they are separated from each other. So when we look at a case of high drops, especially on those histopathology sections which are retrieved from corneas which have undergone high drops and now have undergone optical penetrating keratoplasty, what we find is a type 1 detachment where the edges of the tear 
are there in the uh, pre-desmetic layer and the DM and they remain rolled up or scarred here. The gap in between is usually lined by the endothelium as it slides over the posterior stroma then. In the OCT of these eyes, we can also see that, that there is a desmase along with the pre-desmetic layer detachment. In the periphery, there might be a type 1 tear and is seen as this configuration. But as we come towards the center, there might be a mixed type. However, as we reach the break, there will always be two layers that have detached. So they might be separated from each other, they might not be separated from each other, but they are usually the involvement of both the layers. And of course, there is this presence of intrastromal clefts and all. So in keratoconus, usually these breaks are central or paracentral and usually radial, whereas in PFCD, these are peripheral and crescentic. So uh, based on these uh, uh, findings, Professor Murain from France tried to uh, treat these corneas by opposing the posterior stroma and bringing to the, together the edges of the torn uh, posterior stroma without actually uncurling the DM and they found that on post-op day one there was almost 40% resolution in this edema which increased to the tune of 60% by the end of two weeks. So it helped bringing together the posterior edges uh, of the stroma helped in the uh, faster resolution of uh, edema. In this series by Melly's group in patients who are undergoing DMEC in cases of Fuchs as well as advanced keratoconus uh, where the entire desmase is usually scored and then removed. In one-fourth of those cases, this was also followed by uh, persistent graft detachments. However, none of these cases underwent high drops. In contrast, in, this, uh, uh, in the same group, in keratoconic eyes which were undergoing Bowman's layer transplantation, any inadvertent perforation through the posterior layer, uh, posterior stroma, as well as the DM, during the manual dissection led to an immediate intraoperative occurrence of corneal high drops which was substantiated by the intraoposity as seen here. So they concluded that in eyes with keratoconus, even the complete removal of desmase did not produce high drops, whereas a combined effect in the DM as well as the posterior corneal stroma seemed to consistently elicit a typical corneal high drops. This was furthered by experiments from Dua et al in normal corneas wherein uh, rejected eye bank tissues were taken and there was a slit made of uh, around 50 to 100 microns depth involving the desmase, the pre-desmetic layer as well as the posterior stroma and these eyes were now mounted on the artificial anterior chamber and the uh, uh, pressure was raised up to 60 to 80 mm mercury and they failed to produce any high drops in this. So what does this mean? This means that acute high drops results from tears in desmase membrane as well as the involvement of the duas layer in the context or in the presence of an abnormal collagen and co proteoglycan matrix of keratoconus eyes, not just any normal corneas but in presence of abnormal collagen which can be seen even up to the level of basement membrane. And keratoconus being a multifactorial disease, what role does ha uh, eye rubbing have to play in this? So there were experiments by Kinoshita and Meek group which have subjected normal corneas to transmission electron microscopy and in the picture on the top where we see this pink layer, that's the layer of keratocytes and the blue one depicts the uh, desmase membrane and these yellow structures, these are microfibrillary bundles of elastin which are seen maximum in the duas layer in normal corneas. In contrast, in the lower picture, if keratoconic eyes, especially with eye rubbers, what we see is a total loss or total absence of these yellow fibers, indicating that elastin was degraded in the PDL or the duas layer in keratoconus eyes due, uh, due to eye rubbing. This was also substantiated by immunohistology uh, studies, which showed that in the normal eyes, there is this green elastin layer which is present, which is totally absent in the bottom picture. So this was about pathogenesis, coming over to investigations which are used for anterior segment OCT. The traditional uh, modalities um, uh, for high drop, sorry. The traditional modalities that we use are corneal tomography for the other eye basically to see uh, if there are signs of ectasia in the uninvolved eye and for diagnosing and monitoring its progress. 
uh, ASOCT usually helps us and if the edema is quite significant then uh, ultrasound biomicroscopy along with in vivo confocal microscopy can come to our help. In general, ASOCT is very helpful in characterizing the edema to know the site, size and the configuration of the tear and to monitor the clinical course. So we can know the resolution of edema, reattachment as well as the scar formation predictors. So in this study of 191 eyes, what we saw, uh, what they demonstrated was, this was a prospective study based on uh, all these uh, 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 OCT, uh, uh, serial OCTs taken and they uh, found out that 11 of these 191 eyes had undergone eye drops and what all they studied were epithelial thickness, the stromal thickness, the epithelial to stromal ratio the presence of hyperreflective uh, uh, anomalies over the Bowman's layer as well as presence of work stride. And they devised this classification where they showed that uh, class 3 and uh, 3A and B were more prone to develop high drops and class 4 where there was this panstromal scar was sort of now immune to uh, development of high drops. So this showed that stage 3 had the maximum or the uh, most number of high drops cases. So in classically stage 3, what they saw was uh, increased epithelial uh, thickening along with stromal thinning, the hyper-reflective uh, irregularities of the Bowman's membrane. These were the serial pictures of cases that underwent high drops and there was this presence of intrastromal uh, scars and all and then the resolution with the um, total scar formation. So what they concluded was increased epithelial thickening with stromal thinning at the cone and the presence of anterior hyperreflectivities of the Bowman's layer were predictive of OCT um, uh, developing high drops. The, there was a study by Basu et al. which characterized the three types of um, uh, posterior uh, findings of the DM and there was these ultrasound biomicroscopy studies which can be used to detect the t uh, tear in the DM by visualizing the absence of normal continuous curvilinear uh, hyper intense DM spike. In vivo confocal microscopy also can be used to demonstrate edema, the presence of these keratocytes and uh, the presence of these anti uh, the inflammatory cells like these speckled bodies in the vertical row which predict corneal neovascularization. However, in the regular clinical setting, it's basically a clinical diagnosis. ACT, OCT helps us to uh, capture most of the data and UBM and IVCM can help us later. Thank you. So, I now request Dr. Sumana to please take over and uh, present her, present her uh, talk on conservative management non-surgical strategies in acute high drops management. Thank you, Dr. Sumana. Thanks, Dr. Purvasa. A very good morning to all of you. And it's an honor to be here. I, thanks, uh, I give thanks to AIOS and Dr. Jaya Gupta and Dr. Purvasa for roping me in. So after the fantastic talk that Dr. Purvasa gave, uh, I will talk a few things about the conservative management strategies in acute eye drops. So as she told, it's a self-limiting condition and generally results without intervention in weeks to months. So actually conservative management aims to provide symptomatic relief and promote spontaneous resolution of eye drops via aqueous suppressants, steroids and hyperosmotic agents. We can manage the pain and photophobia with the use of bandage contact lens, cycloplegic agents, dark glasses, and NSAIDs. There is a definite role of broad spectrum antibiotics to prevent the secondary infections, particularly when the epithelium is compromised and if BCL is used. Then the role of antiglaucoma medication being to lessen the hydrodynamic force on the posterior cornea. The risk of infectious keratitis, as Dr. Purvasa has already told, about the cetal positivity, and it's not only about the rupture. It's a transudation of aqueous through the edematous cornea instead of perforation, and we do use aqueous suppressant and pressure patching for these cases. And if there is bullous rupture of the corneal surface, it exposes the raw stroma to the tear flame and ocular common cells. Along with that, 
poor hygiene may lead to infectious keratitis. So we have to be judicious in our use of topical steroids. This is one of my patients, a little kid, who came to me with the uh, acute eye drops and we are getting ready for the GA fitness and all. In the meantime, within three, four days, he came with this pseudomonas ulcer. And we did have a stormy weeks uh, to, but uh, fortunately it healed with uh, medications, but it left an ugly scar. So we had to resort to a penetrating keratoplasty for visual recovery. And the second one being corneal neovascularization during resolution. It is a serious concern when the site of eye drops is actually near the limbal vasculature. And this response may begin two to four weeks after the onset of eye drops. Steroid is again uh, the savior in these cases. And there is a definite role of contact lenses because once the area of eye drops resolves, the previous ectatic area becomes flatter. And so vision may actually be better than prior to onset. So RGP lenses may be easier to fit with a new flatter curvature, and we are uh, resorting to post high drops fitting with scleral contact lens, which actually bridges the patient's unique corneal curvature. So this is the same kid. Unfortunately, in the second eye also he had a high drops. But uh, the parents, uh, after the stormy episode of the other eye, and they didn't want uh, uh, second uh, pneumatic dysmetopexy also. So we treated him with medical management and post resolution three months, his vision with miniscular lenses did improve to 6-9. We resort to pneumatic dysmetopexy early, not only when there is persistence of eye drops despite conservative measures, and the first line intervention includes the intracameral injection of air or 20% SF6 or 14% C3F8. <coughs> the choice between air and gas depends on the estimated amount of time needed to repair the defect in Desmet's membrane. Air being the shortest duration may require repeat bubble placement to achieve the desired effect. SF6 is usually retained for seven to 10 days and C3F8 retained for almost six weeks. So the purpose of pneumatic desmetopexy being creating a barrier to prevent the aqueous humor from passing through the ruptured desmets into the stroma, allow for faster healing of the endothelial cells over the exposed stroma, and deposition of the new desmets membrane, as Dr. Purvasa has already discussed. So DM has to reattach to the posterior stroma, and time for this stage depends on the depth of the DM uh, detachment. The second one being endothelium has to migrate the gap and synthesize a new DM. Time required for this second step depends on the scale of the DM break. So pneumatic des uh, desmetopexy can hasten the DM retachment to the posterior stroma in the first step, but it doesn't help in the second one. So it can tamponate small to medium-sized breaks only and promote more rapid wound healing of corneal endothelial cells. And in larger breaks, the risk of the bubble traversing into the fluid cleft and failing to form a secure transfer tamponade is always there. So these are the clefts where they are usually connected to the anterior chamber by small gaps through which the gas can easily enter into the corneal clefts. So it, this type of cases requires multiple gas injection and this mode of treatment may not be sufficient alone. So what needs to be uh, done will be discussed by the other speakers. So the size, location, and amount of edema should dictate which method of treatment would be most effective. If the high drops is off-center and patient complaints are minimal, we can take a conservative approach of topical therapy. But pneumatic desmetopexy always results in quicker recovery. It shortens the period of discomfort and poor vision. It theoretically decreases the risk of visually significant scarring and need for post-resolution corneal transplant. But there are complications like pupillary block glaucoma, Urez javelia syndrome, stromal cleft, and the accidental seepage of the air bubbles, giving it a fissure appearance, so nullifying the tamponade effect fully. So as uh, Dr. Somshila, madam, will discuss later on, the intracameral gas should be introduced along the iris plane and in a single bubble, and inferior surgical PI is recommended to prevent any episode of acute congestive glaucoma. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. So I think uh, we can.
have the discussion later on after Dr. Sunita's talk. Is that okay? Okay, so uh, ma'am, over to you for strategies and application of compression sutures for rapid resolution of acute eye drops. Yeah, thank you, Purvasha and Jaya, for the session. So I'll be talking on the strategies and application of compression sutures in management of large acute eye drops. As uh, Purvasha and everyone has pointed out, the acute eye drops occurs due to a sudden split in the Desmet's membrane and the Duas layer, leading to fluid accumulation within the stroma. Uh, it's gone into it's gone into slide. Yeah. So there are various management approaches, as we all know. The conservative medical manage all of these may have a role. The conservative medical management uh, is a is favored in majority of the cases and this is based upon the premise that there's a natural mechanism of endothelial cover which happens to cover, seal the defect and that is when resolution of the edema happens. Now one problem with the conservative medical management in large high drops is that it can have a delayed recovery and over a period of time as Suman also pointed out it can lead to corneal vascularization which might become a high risk factor for keratoplasty in future. Intracameral gas injection was a favored strategy for many many years and uh, but the only problem is that when we have intracameral air, it can lead to raised intraocular pressure in an uncontrolled manner. It necessitates a PI to counter this, uh, uh, the effects of intracameral air tamponade. And uh, this is based upon the premise of pushing the posterior membrane to the anterior stroma. So technically, it is not a very ideal procedure as well because the, uh, the keratoconic corneas are biomechanically weaker corneas. And this is also ineffective for inferior breaks. And of course, the other complications related to cataract formation, Ures Avellius syndrome, pupillary block are the unwanted uh, sequelae of having gas bubble in the anterior chamber. Full thickness compression sutures have also been a strategy and this is uh, done to bring the edges of the tear together. But difficulties of inherent to the procedure is there because one cannot pass the full thickness sutures through and through in a grossly edematous hydrops cornea. The sutures are also not designed in a way to pass the sutures through and through the um, area of the high drops. So one of the modified techniques which also works is to apply the sutures in a partial thickness manner and partial thickness means that 50 to 60 percent of the uh, edematous cornea and with this technique you'll be avoiding the use of C3F8 and SF6 gases in the anterior chamber with a minimal retention of air bubble at the end of surgery. And with the compression sutures you can apply for various indications such as keratoconus, pellucid and even other uh, rarer cases such as trauma. And this is just to show one case where this was a patient who had a non-resolving high drops of three weeks duration keratoconus and the patient was developing uh, vessels in the temporal part of the cornea. So this uh, technique will involve making a side pore just as we normally uh, do in other cases and uh, thereafter a gas bubble is injected. This is just uh, air, atmospheric air. So it is uh, filtered air and uh, to delineate the plane at which the posterior membrane is and your sutures are all passed in a partial thickness manner from the periphery to the center. In this case, because we were not able to identify the location of the tear, the suture placement is from the periphery to the center and thereafter in the center there is an infinity suture which is like an overlay and not passing through the stroma. So we can see intraoperatively itself there is a certain degree of resolution of edema happens and on day one we can see a remarkable resolution followed by recovery on the post-operative day three also. Now in this case as the edema resolves in the periphery, the peripheral sutures are redundant. These can be removed as early as 3 to 1 week time. Whereas the central sutures are something which have to be, re uh, we have to be removed later on only when the healing of the posterior membrane defect happens which is anywhere close to 4 to 6 weeks later. This is one more case of pellucid. I think Jaya will um, address this. I am skipping this one. And uh, this was another case of a thin cornea which presented with a 360 degrees breach in the posterior membrane was managed in a similar way by making a side put thereafter an air bubble and the sutures are again placed in the area where you see a relative translucency in the mid peripheral region. The sutures are play placed in this case radially because we are able to know the site of the defect and this is perpendicular to the site of the tear. So following placement of the sutures, a B seal is applied. Yeah, it almost looks like a keratoplasty but that is how it was. And this is a day one picture <coughs> and the one week picture where there is a uh, good resolution of uh, high drops and edema in this particular instance. 
So how do, there are some steps of the surgery which we need to understand why we are taking partial thickness sutures is because uh, making a suture, passing sutures through grossly edematous hydrops cornea, when we pass partial thickness it's way easier to apply these sutures. The sutures also act like conduits and drain the fluid like venting incisions and thereafter and because of this reason we also see the edema resolving intraoperatively itself. We use air, 100% air bubble, not C3, F8 or SF6 and this eliminates the risk of gas bubble complications such as pupillary block and other unwanted sequelae and effects. And this is not dependent upon the location of the tear. So it's not dependent upon where the gas is in the anterior chamber and will have diverse applications. Now with respect to suturing patterns, there can be several patterns which we can apply in taking the sutures. General guiding principle is having the sutures placed perpendicular to the site of tear when it can be identified, when we are able to localize the tear. But we are not, when we are not able to localize it as what is seen in the cartoon B, C, D and E, the placement of the sutures can be arcuate from the periphery to the mid center followed by an infinity or a vertical or a macro suture in the central visual axis. This is also because we don't want the sutures to pass within the stroma and that will induce more scarring in the visual axis. So this could be the various modification configurations of applying the suturing in, um, uh, uh, in high drops. And how do we localize? Quite often the localizing the break on anterior segment OCT is not possible because the cornea is grossly edematous, but intraoperatively using the light pipe or the end durability is also something which can be used to localize the site of the tail. And how the mechanism of uh, res resolution of edema happens is explained by this cartoon where when we apply compression sutures, the compression sutures effect is to bring the anterior surface closer to the posterior membrane and thereby the natural process is facilitated. Now we did this technique in um, uh, 29, more than 29 eyes but I am just presenting this data where we looked at the resolution of edema with respect to the preoperative baseline edema. So most of all of these cases were grade 3 edema meaning they were more than 5 to 6 millimeters in diameter and the resolution of edema was quite dramatic and 76 percent if we look if we uh, grade it to the preoperative baseline level uh, on day one and subsequently 92 to 99 percent by two three weeks later. Mean tachymetry which was unrecordable at the baseline became recordable on day one itself and was gradually reducing over period of time. Majority of the cases yes it, this will not prevent complete scarring majority of the cases could be managed with glass and contact lenses and some one patient did require a, a keratoplasty because he did not want to use contact lenses. But these are some of the representative cases as we see preoperative picture and then on the same day the, how the picture looks like and then on the day four the edema resolution which happens uh, dramatically on the next one week. And this is again one more case where we see a significant uh, edema in the center and there are multiple loculi, so there are multiple openings in the posterior membrane and with a similar technique the patient has a good resolution. One more case. Uh, this particular case I just wanted to highlight, this was a patient who has a Down syndrome in five weeks history and he was extremely photophobic. So this is a grossly edematous cornea and this is almost like a long history and uh, some bit of fibrosis starts setting in because of the long standing high drop. So it's not an ideal situation but because your sutures when you pass will keep on breaking because of fibrosis you cannot have a real very compression effect, you have to take sutures multiple times. But then still because the patient was very symptomatic and we had to manage this case, uh, we took the patient and uh, with the same technique it was from the periphery to center, the sutures were applied and on table like towards the conclusion of the surgery, there's a, the eye looks way better and since we wanted to remove all the sutures and day one also the peripheral edema clears but uh, since we have to remove all sutures in one go not give multiple anesthesia to this patient, at two months when all sutures were removed this patient had a decently uh, fair uh, corneal scarring and uh, relatively a better looking eye compared to how he, it would have healed otherwise in a, a long, long time. So this is something which can be even adopted for large high drops with a long standing history. Now this is one case which I would just want to share here, not that uh, it has to be done in every case, but this was a patient who had uh, again multiple loculi on the posterior membrane and this can be made out from the profile view of the patient and you can see that there is a relative translucence in the center. There are multiple loculi and the cornea is grossly edematous. And if you look at the anterior <coughs> part of the cornea on the OCT, uh, there is a large area of defect there. Now in such cases, quite often when we pass sutures, a little tighter sutures, it can lead to cheese wiring of the epithelium. So this was one modified thing which um, was done in this case where um, instead of taking sutures directly and we can see that the center area, there is a big defect over there. So we used a BCL. 
Uh, the technique is similar, but just instead of just applying the sutures directly over the cornea, uh, BCL was shaped into an 8 millimeter fashion and this was placed in the central area and sutures were passed over this. So instead of <coughs> sorry, having the, the sutures pass uh, without the contact lens, we placed it over the contact lens. This is just to avoid the cheese wiring which would have otherwise happened because the anterior part of the epithelium seemed very thinned out. So this uh, sutures in a similar way are over the BCL. Now we can use many other um, things for this purpose. It could be a Bowman's membrane or anything else which could be used. Uh, so Mashila sometimes suggested even amniotic membrane, but yes, uh, Bowman's membrane I guess would be a good alternative. But in this case, this was one of the cases where uh, BCL was applied to manage this case and then subsequently on uh, day one, this was the picture and this is the one week picture with, so we again we remove the sutures early in this patient. But this is the algorithm for management, do we need to do compression sutures in all cases, it's not required for the grade one and grade two where the diameter is less than five where always is the conservative management which is preferred. But for something which is above grade three uh, um, and uh, more than five, six millimeters, this certainly helps in little faster resolution. Thank you. so much Dr. Sunita ma'am for sharing your experience and beautiful videos with innovative techniques. I now request uh, Dr. Somashila to please take over uh, her talk on is desometopexy obsolete? Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, actually I really wanted to go before Sunita because after her presentation I, I think there's no is. I think desometopexy alone is probably obsolete. So I'm just going to show a small case. In fact, I've also stopped doing desmetopexy uh, after Sunita's work and uh, one of the videos was also mine, by the way. <laughs> the PMCD, that was a remarkable case. The patient's conledema cleared within an hour. I was just describing post-operatively when we op opened the patch. That was an amazing case. The first case that I did under her guidance. So this was way back when we were doing, when in the dark ages, when we were doing <laughs> only desperatopexy 16, uh, in 2016. So 10 year old girl, okay, <laughs> have a counter to that. <laughs> no, okay, so that's why it still is obsolete. Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, so, Okay, so yeah, I'm not saying that it's there's no role for it. Yeah, maybe I jest, but uh, to come to the subject. So this was a patient who uh, had presented with acute high drops uh, in the right eye and advanced ketoconus. Also, the child had Down syndrome, and you know often that these patients come with very advanced disease. So I'm going to the eye that had acute high drops when the child presented, and uh, this is the preoperative OCT. We are familiar that you know you have uh, fluid in various layers of the stroma and it's not just uh, that you can very often you can't even see the the DM break because there's so much fluid in these eyes and this is a slit lamp image and all of this you can see that there are locule loculated flu fluid clefts in the stromal areas they're both intracellular and extracellular you know with histopathology so uh, after, so we decided to go ahead with desmetopexy and uh, our practice was to do air desmetopexy initially and uh, of course a surgical PI and then if uh, it's still if it persists then the second time around we would usually do an isoexpansile gas. Some of us would select an isoexpansile in the first go itself uh, but because of its problems and in a patient like this you don't want to take up for GE repeatedly I decided to go ahead with air only and this was uh, in our hands, it used to work fairly well. In a week or two weeks, we used to see good results with desmetopexy. So here on day four, we saw that the edema had certainly cleared, but the OCT also shows something similar. At least the edema, uh, at least the fluid in the posterior cornea seemed to have decreased, but this large cleft of fluid was still there, and uh, we decided to wait and uh, used conservative therapy. But by day 14, Again, uh, what you can notice is that the entire cornea is very edematous and also, again, you can see fluid. So that was not tamponading the break. Perhaps the air uh, absorbed partially. So the plan was to repeat the desmetopexy. And in this situation, uh, we used some of the techniques that we do in DSEC. And uh, what we did is that 
first of all made a, the side port and released the aqueous fluid and we made a v sort of a venting incision here and manually massaged the fluid in the interface because as you remember the OCT showed that a lot of fluid was very anterior just below the epithelium so gently massaged and you can as you keep doing it you could see that there's some uh, decrease in the fluid and the corneal layers get a little bit clearer and the the eye looks a little collapsed that's because the fluid is just coming coming out of the corneal layers and just very gently kept doing this we kept the air in the AC so we don't inadvertently collapse the AC and contact the the crystalline lens and we did refill the air I've edited all of that out and this uh, took, spent a good five minutes in very gently massaging this we don't have intra-op OCT I think that would have helped a lot for us to see how much air there is so we kept doing that and at the end of it uh, th th this time refilled with gas with iso expensile C3 F8 uh, f uh, all, uh, kept a full chamber air fill for about seven eight minutes and after that released just a little bit of air so that so that it was mobile and there was I didn't do a surgical PI the first time round. I did it the second time when we used iso expansile gas so this actually worked pretty well but I, I must tell you that if I do this case now I would definitely apply compression sutures as well I would use air perhaps but I would resort more of compression sutures because this is proving the point that a lot of fluid which is anterior is not you're not able to get at it with the air so the air we can just or the or the gas that can just scaffold the uh, the DM the idea is to have it there it's not like it'll push the DM back you know that so the idea is to have it there so that the pseudo uh, cornea that we see in histopath comes back and it helps the endothelial cells slide back into place and that's how the the break is sealed and it's not that you have a new DM over there uh, so this was this child did pretty well this was six months out and child con uh, is now in in the late not even 20 and uh, uses a scleral contact lens but not uh, all the time and with the scleral contact lens the vision is 2050 so we uh, avoided doing a graft and the other eye is fairly good for this uh, young patient so uh, Sunita already covered this so I'll skip all of this yeah. so is it obsolete I would say no but would I do it only as only technique in my hands now I've changed my practice so ever since we did the study with Sunita I'm very convinced that uh, both compression sutures as well as air both combined together would probably give the best outcome but you have to decide case to case based on what kind of uh, uh, DM break it is and what kind of ectasia we're looking at so yeah thank you thank you Dr. Somashila I now invite the discussion and Dr. Rajesh sir was trying to say something about Sunita's work is excellent, but compression sutures have been described before as well. And they can be full thickness, they can be 50, 60 percent thickness, they can, some people almost put near decimates. People have attempted this. So the only comment is, I think, if you see a patient with high drops, conservative management also works. It depends on the severity of the high drops. So if you see a patient, if you see a child, I don't think the first instance would be either to put a gas or put com compression sutures how symptomatic and how severe the high drops is, you will initially treat with medical management and see. If you see a good resolution with the medical management, then you don't need to intervene. But if it is something that is not showing results, and if you are doing OCT and you find that it's remaining the same, then you discuss the option of intervention. If the break is not very big and not as severe as what you have seen in some of these cases, putting a simple gas air or gas bubble with uh, an inferior PI also works. So it doesn't involve any suturing in the cornea. Now, suturing the cornea is good, but remember in an edematous cornea, when you try to put sutures, your sutures are going to cheese wire. So the principle how in Sunita's videos is working, those sutures, they're not working primarily by compression. What they are doing is they're also creating a track for the fluid to come out, okay? So it's the same thing what Dr. Vajpayee had shown, you know, he was putting a venting incision in the same way to release fluid from those pockets. So when, when the sutures are passed in the edematous cornea in the periphery, it's allowing the fluid to seep out, and at the same time, the swollen tissue is compressed. So it, it cannot, the, the fluid cannot refill them. What is important in what technique I would do is, I would put those mattress sutures, because the sutures are in the normal cornea. So they are less wire, likely to cheese wire when you put across a larger area. You put a contact lens, maybe I would go one step forward, I would take maybe a DSAC cap or a corneal tissue, punch out a small button, 
and I will use that the same way they put in scleral buckle. They put the buckle material, put the sutures over it, and the buckle then, so why not do the same thing on the cornea? And instead of using a contact lens, which is very thin, doesn't have the rigidity, why not take a corneal tissue? Take a corneal tissue of 300, 400 microns, punch out a small piece, put it there, and then use, maybe even if you wanted to use, put, instead of 10 -zero nylon, you can even use 8 -zero vicryl to get the kind of compression effect press the cornea and then put a contact lens. So then what happens is once the edema resolves, then this can be, you can remove it over a period of few weeks. And being a corneal tissue, this is just, I've not done it, but this is just an afterthought looking at that. So I think it's important to identify, plan, and then do it. And putting sutures, because these sutures are likely to become loose, don't send your patients away. You need to see them because a loose suture in that scenario can be a, with the edematous cornea, can be an idus for infection. And if your patient tends to have an infection in that scenario, like what Sumana was showing in her patient, if you have coexisting allergic eye disease or something like that, it can be very detrimental for the patient as well. So we need to have a mix of all these different techniques and then choose it and use it for our patients. But yes, high drops can be managed, but you have to like, you, you have to observe and then do it. Despite doing the best of suturing, sometimes the edema may resolve, but the scar may still persist, so they may still require some sort of surgical procedure. But performing a surgical procedure in a non-edematous cornea is far easier than trying to do it in a cornea that's completely swollen. I would like to counter-argue, if I can, Purvasha. Sure. Uh, so about the initial part when you mentioned that, the, that, that we, can we can do conservative management. So Sain Basu from our team had, had published long back that he had compared patients where we had conservatively managed as a group and those patients that we had intervened. And he had showed very conclusively that though both groups work, but the time that it takes for yeah, intervention is cut down by half. I just want to complete. So number one is that the time it takes is cut down by half, which is very important in pediatric patients. Maybe not so much in adult patients. Of course, the adult patients, will they're very concerned, all of them, that they, you know, it's not going away. You know that. They keep asking. So that is one aspect. Psychologically, they're very disturbed and so on. But for the pediatric patients, it makes a difference. The second point I had, which Sunita and Murli's group, they've looked at, is the vascularization. The more you let the edema be in the cornea, the more are going to be the vessels, especially because we have a lot of patients with allergy. And then that compromises eventually when you want to do a transplant or even a sure. DALC. So these are the two reasons I'm strongly convinced that there, there's more role, except as Dr. Subhana said, that when you have a peripheral high drops. So there's more role of okay. intervention than conservative therapy in, in a large majority. And about desmetopexy, you have to see it to believe. Imagine for 15, 20, 15 years of my career, I'm doing only desmetopexy. And you have to see what these, so this is not the compression suture's full thickness. So, and each case is a little different. So there's an algorithm. I'm sorry, I'm just going on. No, no, no. But I, I completely agree case, with your point. But yeah. what I'm trying to tell you is, depending on the severity of the high drops, every case of high drop doesn't present like what Shunita has shown. So, and when I, when I said conservative management, I don't mean for months. I said at least for the first one or two weeks. In one or two weeks, you are not going to get vascularization because there have been cases where even they come back. Sometimes we explain to the patient that you need a procedure. They say we need time to think. And they come back in two weeks' time, and then you see that you see a different clinical picture. So I said that for every case, you don't really need to jump in and immediately intervene, waiting for a week or two. Because if you have a break and you give them hyperosmotics, if it starts showing signs of resolution, you can avoid intervening, especially in a pediatric case. But yes, I completely agree with your point that leaving it for months and then letting vascularization, scarring and everything, which can then finally affect the final visual outcome, you really need to look at it. Maybe you're seeing the most more severe cases, so I'm not disagreeing with your point, but we have a general audience. We don't want every person to go back and every high drops they see, I don't want them to go back and, because if they create a problem while suturing, if they perforate, if they have a leak, if they have some other problem, it can make it much more difficult to. And there have been other things described in literature as well. I think maybe there are other talks which talk about it, about people have described doing a DMEC as well to seal that break. Maybe a DSEC lenticule has been put Greg Moloney has also described using rock inhibitors, and they have found that by using rock inhibitors, they have found rapid re resolution of high drops as well. So these are again things which we need to look at, whether we need to add a rock inhibitor when you see a patient with high drops as well. Yeah, that's okay. I don't think that the reticular edema is the thing for which you do that. Even if I have patients, if I tell them, 
the reticular edema, they, if you convince them, they say, okay, it doesn't make, but ultimately you want to look at what beneficial effect it's giving over a period of time. I think it was the end of the Sain Basu's or Pruffles paper that I read that, that if the edema is uh, within 3 millimeter or between 3 to 5 and then beyond 5. So beyond 5, I think, to intervene. And uh, so there was a question yesterday in the Lamla group, some doctor had posted about the PMCD and he, uh, he was asking uh, whether, what should I do, would I intervene or not to intervene? <laughs> One point uh, about pellucid, I think it becomes more of a therapeutic also in pellucid because uh, it's just nature's way where uh, you know, there's a split has happened. But when you take the sutures, the patient's refractive outcomes become way better. So I think there, even if it is in a very focal region, we should just simply apply. And in fact, those are the cases where I don't even remove the sutures, worry about it because I just keep them for a long. And once the healing is really strong, then only the sutures are removed. There's a more therapeutic and refractive indication for doing it. We should put the compression sutures back. I now invite I just, Dr. Jaya. Uh, just one question. Why not, uh, why don't you, why don't you prefer full thickness sutures because that's more easier to do it. Okay, to go past. You, you also have a potential risk of having an infection, you know, when you have a suture tract leak. Right. One more problem if you're taking full thickness is that when you remove the sutures and if the healing has not happened in that area, you'll have a fistula there. It will keep on leaking. So I think that's also a point against putting full thickness sutures. Thank you for the interactions. Now I request Dr. Jaya to present her case on compressor sutures in uh, PMCD. And then after that, uh, Dr. Sharon will give her talk on DALC. We just thought to complete this discussion as of now. So, okay. So, uh, I'll start. so I'll be presenting this efficacy of compression sutures in the rapid resolution of acute high drops in a case of pellucid marginal degeneration. So this was a 47-year male who came to me on 14th March 2023 with the complaints of redness, blurred vision, right eye since one day. There was history of healed high drops in the left eye a decade back. Uncorrected visual acuity in both the eyes was 6 by 60 and these are the clinical pictures where we see the ectatic thin inferior uh, cornea along with corneal edema. So uh, we had his pentacam uh, in July 2020 when he visited us last and now in March 23 where we see that the keratometry uh, K max has uh, increased from 76.7 diopters to 83.8 and we also note the edematous cornea, the pachymetry initially in July 2020 being 522 and it was now 904. And this is the ASOST picture which shows the detachment with a break. So the three options available to me at this time was whether I do conservative management with topical hypertonic saline steroids and anti-glaucoma medications or we do the desmetopexy with 14% C3F8 and 20% SF6 or we go ahead with full thickness compression sutures with or without intracambral long acting gases. So at this point I had a discussion with Dr. Sunita uh, since we were all reading her, uh, um, uh, this paper of hers and she beautifully guided me through her notes and diagrams how to proceed the case. So uh, what she suggested was she's already shown it with a side port entry AC paracentesis, place an air bubble for a, um, a small air bubble and then to place the sutures. But what ma'am had suggested was this figure of eight and vertical mattress sutures. I was most comfortable with placing radial sutures so I went ahead with this. 
so this is i don't have a surgical video but this is how i just placed the radial sutures using 10 zero uh, nylon and this is the first post-operative day one picture where we see that the edema has cleared quite a lot and on post-operative day three this was the picture when almost all of the edema has gone and even on the asoct we see a very well settled uh, desmids and the refraction the patient's best corrected visual acuity had improved to 618 with a very minimal correction so at three months later we did the suture removal and uh, the uncorrected visual acuity being 6 by 36 though there was a change in refraction so um, and this is the final picture of the patient and in topography we again noticed that the k max from 83.8 had now come down to 61.9 diopters so uh, that was my case and and conclude over here. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaya. Now request Dr. Sharon to present her talk on nuances in PK and uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty in high drops. Thank you, Sharon, for being here with us. Good morning, everyone. Um, at the outset, thank you to AOS and thank you to Dr. Purvasha and Dr. Jaya for including me in this session. It's been lovely talks till now. Um, so we're switching gears a little bit. Um, I'm going to be talking about what we do once that uh, high drops resolves. Um, I haven't done any PKO DALC in, in acute high drops, but I'm sure uh, our erudite audience and uh, panelists may have some input, so I would welcome them. So when we are talking about doing a corneal transplant in a patient who has healed from high drops, there are a few decisions to be made. One is, of course, if you're doing a transplant, what kind of transplant we would like to do. Um, and uh, a preference would always be to try for a lamella keratoplasty, in this case being a DALC. And how we make that decision is, of course, uh, a very strict slit lamp examination and anterior segment OCT to look for the scar. Uh, and what you're looking at is trying to see the location of the scar, so whether it's central or it's off the visual axis. Of course, it's going to be deep, but what is very interested, interesting is that when it heals, even though the, we, ex, we see that it's a large scar, if you look on the slit lamp, uh, there may not be a very large involvement of the DM endothelium um, uh, complex in the visual axis. And in that case, then again, we can get away with doing a lamellar keratoplasty. Um, so when we're looking at doing a DALC, what we need to understand is how we size the graft. We want to include the entire cone. And this is another benefit of waiting for the hydrops edema to resolve. Uh, because once it resolves, you can actually assess how large your graft needs to be and how where you need to uh, you know, position your graft. The depth, of course, uh, when we're doing the peripheral dissection depends when we're starting on the thickness there. But usually it's similar to what we are doing for a regular DALC. Uh, preferred technique in this uh, condition post high drops would be a manual dissection. Uh, better to avoid a big bubble because during a big bubble injection, you can have a split in the area which was the earlier uh, high drops break. Um, and uh, even if you do have a small uh, perforation when you're doing the dissection, most of the time it can be managed and we very rarely have to convert to a penetrating keratoplasty. Um, so when we're doing the things to plan preoperatively and intraoperatively for this is, of course, where to start the dissection. Usually, uh, similarly to how we do uh, a regular DALC, we do start in the periphery, and I'll show a small video for that. And there are various techniques for manual dissection. Um, so one of the common techniques is to start peripherally and then move all around. Certain instruments which might help us, and blunt versus uh, sharp, and we'll discuss this through this very short video. So I've already done the uh, trephination towards the periphery, and you know what the depth you've gone. Um, so um, one uh, easy thing to do is try to go in deep, like how we do it when we're going uh, to our uh, form our big bubble. So you try to go as close to the DM as possible, and then use a blunt tip scissors to uh, do a, a, a very minimal dissection. Uh, you can use, avoid uh, too much of sharp dissection, but in the areas where you think the break may be, as you're pulling, do not pull too hard because you can have a break there. And th that area, you can just use the crescent to very gently release the fibers. Do not try to um, dissect too deeply. So I'll just show a few cases to illustrate how you know we can get fairly good results. So this was uh, a, a child who had a large hydrops. You can see the intrastromal 
clefts there. And we did do a compression sutures and early uh, resolution of edema, as was beautifully shown in the previous uh, talks. Um, but you do get, of course, scarring in the visual axis, and which is, again, seen, um, which, which you look on a diffuse image, you can think that the scar looks very di you know, diffuse. But if you look uh, on the slit and on the anterior segment OCT, you can actually see that the involvement of the DM endothelium part is, is fairly small. And in this case, then, you can get away with doing uh, a lamellar keratoplasty. Even though it's a manual, you can see there's a small amount of residual stroma. But you can get away with a fairly clear cornea and great results. A case which is slightly worse, a large area of um, edema there. Uh, again, in this case, this is one of my earlier cases, and I wanted to highlight something here. Uh, because it was uh, bang in the visual axis, I thought I didn't feel like putting a suture right in the center. And you see the difference from the previous case. You can see that the, there's this gap, a spindle-shaped gap, where the DM did not oppose. And the scarring is actually worse in that, and which is, again, seen on the slit lamp image as well. So the, the sutures actually help the apposition very well and do help reduce you know, we don't get as much of scarring. Uh, you can still get away with doing a DALC, um, and the scar is not that visible, except if you look at an angle, and these patients still have good visual outcomes. So the, the need to, you know, do a penetrating keratoplasty in most of these cases is uh, limited. So what do you do in case of a perforation? Of course, it depends on where the perforation happened and where in the surgery. If you finished most of your dissection and left with a very small part of your dissection, then you don't need to worry at all. Um, you can either continue with your dissection or just leave a small patch of stroma there um, to try and uh, you know, just tamponade it till you finish the rest of your dissection. And you can see this towards uh, the edge. I'm almost finished with the dissection and think you know, I'm clear through. Um, but just at the end, you have a dissection, uh, you have a perforation. So another uh, advan you know, tip there would be to avoid, I'm using a crescent, and that was the mistake, uh, thinking that there's uh, not much of a, can I move it? Not much of a chance of a, a perforation, but then overconfidence always leads to a fall. So uh, that's the perforation. So um, nothing much to do. You just do the, you know, give a little tamponade, complete your uh, dissection. And because we've already finished most of the other dissection, it doesn't matter. Uh, penetrating keratoplasty, if you really have a very, very large scar and you think it's not going to benefit from a lamellar keratoplasty, uh, you can go ahead and do a penetrating keratoplasty. Sizing and uh, positioning remains regular, but the technique can be modified depending on type, location of ectasia. In this case, um, the, we did a femtosecond uh, keratoplasty for this patient, and he did very, very well. Um, this was a patient who had a large uh, hydrops as, sorry, some animation. Um, yeah, so the same case, which I had the image, you can see that there's a large high drops, which clears beautifully with the compression sutures, but the posterior scarring was quite significant, and so we went and did a keratoplasty. My last case, which I wanted to show, like many of the cases, this is a PMCD, uh, but what was interesting is that the break was much more uh, central rather than periphery when we looked uh, on the imaging and on the slit lamp. Um, so then, once we had done the compression sutures, we were left with a case where you have the central scarring and inferior thinning, um, which then we were trying to wonder how to tackle. And um, to try and tackle both the problems, I did a tuck-in ker penetrating keratoplasty, um, which results in a slightly bulkier edge. Uh, so you can see the scarring there, but the central area is good, and it has the advantage of not having to take a very, very large, full thickness uh, keratoplasty. So the benefits of uh, maybe doing, you know, waiting, uh, uh, of uh, doing it in a chronic stage with this an acute, acute, of course, you can reduce the number of interventions required for the patient. But sometimes in chronic, if we wait, we've done the compressions, which is all the desmetopexy, um, the scarring, you know, uh, the final scarring is fairly minimal, and you can get away with even a scleral lens or. Uh, sometimes you may not need that and may even avoid a keratoplasty in some cases. Uh, so uh, you can judge from case to case on whether you want to go ahead for acute or chronic. So uh, I'm sure there may be a lot of uh, comments and suggestions from our panelists here, and I welcome them. Um, but 
uh, PK hotel can be planned in a heel corneal hydrox if required, preferably to do a manual dissection which gives excellent results. Patient needs to be counseled and that's very, very important about the recovery and you know some residual scarring which we may have. And assessment of the size and location of the scar is essential so that we can plan the surgery properly and give a good post-operative outcomes. Thank you. Russia, I'm in time. For finishing on time and with such a lovely presentation, I request Dr. Rishi to um, comment on the cases. And meanwhile, I request Dr. Praful to please go ahead with his um, presentation on uh, recalcitrant cases using uh, the microscope integrated OCT. Um, thank you, Dr. Poor Russia. Uh, lovely course. And uh, I think the first case was a perfect case and uh, I think compression sutures were the perfect management strategy. You did perfectly well. So there's really nothing new to tell. In your case, it's a lovely presentation, but I feel that the last case where you did the tuck in, uh, tuck in penetrating, you could have done a lamella. Yeah. It was an. <laughs> yeah. But so you'll be surprised sometimes how you may not get 2020, but you may, even 2030 is a good outcome. And over time with remodeling, even that kind of gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Especially because it's a larger graft, the chance of failure is, will be always there. Yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yes. Also, there have been some publication about the use of DALC in acute hydrops. Um, it will work. I think it works like compression sutures, but I think it's an overkill. So, uh, I, I think with this strategy of compression sutures first and then sometimes even if you have a scar but in between if you have clear areas you will get pretty good vision and you may not even need contact lenses sometimes. So uh, I think that, that should completely be avoided uh, doing a keratoplasty in an acute head drops as far as possible. Excellent cases. Now what I in addition to the you know doll you know I rotate the scar can actually push the scar away from the visual axis. It works extremely well in children as well. But patient counseling is very important because we have one patient where Dr. Dabaswe did a, a, a dark in high yield high drops. Then he left to Australia. So he got his other eye PKP done. And then he came to us requesting, please give it, do a PKP in my this eye also. <laughs> <laughs> Murli, I, I have a, a small comment. I have done a few rotational autographs. All of them end up with a lot of astigmatism for some reason. And especially in kids that can be quite amblyogenic. So somehow I have not had great, even though the central visual axis is very clear, um, uh, uh, final outcome somehow is not, uh, a little suboptimal. You are right, you know, rotating the flat peripheral cornea into center and we are using the same trephine ideally, right? So, since you are refining from epithelial side, you would lose about 0.34 millimeter of tissue. So, you are using a smaller tissue. So, you end up having a buckling. So, yeah. And I think it should be resolved for a one eye cases. Yeah. Right? It should not be done. If the other eye is good, so they will curse us for a lifetime, as you rightly said. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Purvasa and Dr. Jaya for inviting me to this. I think most of the discussion have already been done by Dr. Fogla and uh, Somjila, ma'am. So I'll just skip to the uh, case that I'm going to present. So this was the case. It was a case of 14-year female patient with uh, IFC with hydrops. And uh, you can see the fundus picture. Of course, this was after the hydrops healed. And uh, this was the other eye. So we, we, we went out with this technique. This is Dr. Basfei's technique. Initially, he, we used to do pre-op ACE OCT base. Now, since we have microscope integrated OCT, we use this. So here, as you can see, it was, the, uh, it was a case of, uh, yeah. As you can see, the DM was not detached here, what we could see. Only the problem was fluid-filled pockets. And the patient was non-resolving even one attempt of C3 effect because C3 effect probably wouldn't have helped in this patient because DM is already attached here. So what we did, we went out with MVR knife and made some venting incision, draining from the uh, fluid pockets. The MIOCT helps you to directly monitor where you are going uh, into, whether you are into the cavity or going somewhere else and uh, massage with intra uh, and filling the entire inter chamber with air that helps you to resolve the cases so this is a brief video of that and this was the patient uh, 
as you can see it resolved within one week and uh, this is the extended version of the division just I would like to continue few things yes so at times it's not that easy as you can see a lot of bleeding happened in this patient because there was a limbal vascularization was there however in the end after repeated massage we could take out uh, fluid from all the cavities so the techniques works by a doctor Rajesh said uh, it's not the, the basically this compression suture or draining by MVR knife it's all works by taking out the fluid from the fluid pockets which might have taken almost uh, five two three months to resolve so this we published so recalcitrant hydrops yes i missed that slide recalcitrant hydrops as sir was saying we don't do these techniques directly for every patient we give one attempt of c3 of it if that doesn't work then we go for this however when a patient present like this was the case of six patients we published of course it's a letter to editor because the editor was waiting for Sibelman to publish one case then only they let us publish our six cases so the thickness was more than 1600 in all these cases and this technique uh, worked well all of, all of them resolved in f four to six weeks except one patient where the symptom increased at six weeks but however that also resolved with medical management only so these are the few cases that in which we did this case and compression suture DMAG, yeah, these are the techniques that have been described so each time we discuss about hydrops then i go back and uh, re-evaluate my post of pictures then what what my observation is that if you see this image here there is not much uh, fluid pockets here in this patients probably simply doing a conservative or c3 pet may work but this was the patient where I was showing you. As you can see, a lot of fluid pockets were there, but not much DM detachment. Probably in this case, as a partial thickness suture or drainage using uh, venting incision uh, would help. This is a case which, uh, one of my case which resolved with uh, this stream technique. But you can see there was a gap. Okay, And that there was a gap between the posterior stroma and the DM2 probably retrospectively what I feel in these patients probably a full thickness suture would have helped in opposing the DM to the posterior stroma so it has to be a case based uh, approach um, one technique doesn't fit to all spectrum of hydrops conservative measures yes you should try if the hydrops is mild uh, that was the Miata grading which Dr. Jaya was uh, saying less than 3, 3 to 5 more than 5 less than 3 there is always a road for recalcitrant hydros where one attempt of C3 but has failed. Maybe all these techniques should be done. With this I'll conclude here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, these comments? are new cases yes. like there was a discussion. You know, vascularization, melting, fistula, all this can happen if you don't uh, treat these cases in timely manner. Prapul, in your case, you know, your OCT did not pick up the breach. If you use a UBM, because, you know, even to the date, I see every month one forceps-related eye drops in a new neonate. And I also see a PCG where having an eye drops. So this kind of a cleft is seen when you have a, you know, track. UBM actually picks up that communicating track. We, we, have we had a publication on UBM too, sir, long time back. But we have realized that ASOCD can also give you... Uh, those tracks because uh, we have seen the tracks in few patients and within, whenever we find such tracks we avert this technique because that will create a direct fistula to the external surface so we avert those techniques. ASOSD also fair enough to give you but yes if Indima is too much it's a hazy cornea then UBM would be better than ASOSD. So, so you know the compression suture generally resorted to the moderate to severe cases where this has mechanistically addressed the you know, corneal weakening because you know it's unable to contain the biomechanical stress so we want to obliterate the potential space between the desmet endothelium complex from the stroma so whereas an air bubble i think it doesn't do that thing it's something like offering a band-aid for a that, that tamponade for that uh, brief period only so and that it other potential disadvantage of air for a long time let's say you use a gas which tend to stay for about four weeks it is potentially toxic to endothelium so, see, one of the reasons we have an extremely good uh, outcome following a keratoplasty is the peripheral endothelial reserve. You end up, you know, compromising that endothelium by injecting a gas, so it actually depletes our focus. That, that's, uh, well, uh, what I would say, the gas is endothelial toxic, that's based on experimental studies only. Clinical studies haven't proven that, so I'm not saying <laughs> you may be wrong, but for an institute like LVP or RPC, maybe putting compression suture is okay. 
but for practitioners you, it's a you have to look at the anatomy of it yeah. what he is mentioning that if you have a break you can tamponade it from within by putting a gas bubble but if you have a cornea that's swollen unless this break is completely covered the fluid will continue to leak so that potential space has to also to be reduced so that's, that's where the compression so suture it compresses the corneal stroma so whenever the fluid leaks out it that by uh, it basically improves the you know they both work synergistically the uh, the gas yeah, or the air yeah for such cases and definitely. the sutures yeah as i showed in that picture for such and cases between oct and does. ubm ubm sometimes can give you a wider range of where oct you may lose because if there is massive edema but your screen may not capture the entire thing you may see be, uh, the top you may not see the bottom you know so and if there is severe edema of fluid pocket shadowing so you don't see the posterior imaging very clearly ubm in those scenarios can give you a much better picture yes but although sir, the newer uh, uh, octs uh -huh. are better they have yeah. a wider range so ubm you know uh, as i said we used to do that regularly in all cases but uh, you know the uh, quality of image that used to get is not that good like a octs so at times even it's difficult to identify where exactly the dm is so that was the issue that's why we shifted to a octs <laughs> thank you so much for this we'll interactive session that. thank you everyone i now request everyone to be on the stage for a group photograph after this we can hand over the days